Welcome to As the Key Turns. I'm David Lehman, and I worked at the first Supermax prison in America, USP Marion, for 23 years. And this is just a part of my story. Two guards were stabbed to death at USP Marion in a single day in October of 1983. Many have heard of Tommy Silverstein, who killed Officer Klutz by stabbing him 29 times. What is not so well known is the story of the other murder that day, the murder of Officer Hoffman at the hands of Clayton Fountain. This will be a look at convict Fountain and the story of his murders. Before we get started, I'd like to ask you to hit the subscribe button and the bell so you can be notified when I release another video. Also, don't be an ass. Hit the like button, please. I promise it won't kill you. <clears throat> U.S. Attorney Frank Hess said about Fountain, quote, I have never in 18 years of law practice ever found a stone-cold killer that deserves a death penalty more than he does. To those of you who keep asking, rest assured, I'll get to the Tommy Silverstein story as well in, a, in another video sometime in the future. Um, he'll have a small part in this story, but for the majority of the time, this will be about that other killer at Marion, Clayton Fountain. Serial killer is defined as a person who kills three or more people. Given that definition, then Fountain was a serial killer before he murdered Officer Hoffman. He killed the officer to keep up with the competition he had of killing people with Thomas Silverstein. After Fountain killed his fifth and final victim in 1984, he was given a special cell deep in the heart of the Federal Medical Center in Springfield, Missouri. He deserved to be hanged, but at the time of his, the, his killings, there was no federal death penalty. That mistake has since been rectified. Even so, no prisoners have been executed yet for killing a federal guard. Juries don't believe our lives are just that valuable. The cell Fountain had at Springfield was set up so that he had no contact with anybody but the guards. It was collectively decided that the officers would never speak to him. When he was fed three times a day, the guy feeding him would refuse to respond to anything Fountain said. Few humans can stand total social isolation for very long. I've seen prisoners, uh, quote, put on the program, unquote, as we call it, and they have uh, just started to lose touch with reality in less than three months. Fountain was subjected to this treatment for over a decade. The punishment for the murder of a guard is insanity. It is inflicted upon the prisoner by means of social isolation and withholding of the acknowledgement of his even existence. He is treated as if he were a ghost. He was one of the few prisoners who was locked up and the key was thrown away for over 21 years. The only human voices he was to hear on a regular basis was from the unit for the criminally insane that was in the same building he was. He could hear their screams and their cries from his cell. To yell back brought the guards to his cell to shut him up. It was a rare, the, it was rare that the insane prisoners even attempted to answer his back as, uh, you know, their demons were just too loud for him to hear you know, him yell out. He sat alone, unacknowledged, for year upon year. He had time to reflect on the mistakes of his life. This is the story of those mistakes and how Clayton Fountain came to be given five consecutive life sentences. His story ends at a cemetery in the Ozark Mountains of Missouri on the 11th of July 2005 and it starts on the 6th of March 1974 in Subic Bay, the Philippines. Fountain was a well-trained Marine. He would use his training to great advantage in prison. While a member of the 3rd Platoon, Hotel Company, 2nd Battalion, 4th Marines, stationed at Camp Hansen, Okinawa, Japan, he was sent to jump school. Paratrooper school was run by the U.S. Army's 3rd Special Forces Group, or the Green Berets as they're more commonly known. He was to earn his jump wings with that school. A prestigious honor. Uh, Ten mile runs were common, you know, for training every day in that unit. After Fountain finished jump school and earned his wings, his unit started intense training. He was given extensive training in the use of a knife 
and a garret to silently kill. He was given instruction in hand-to-hand -hand combat every day for months. He was proficient in the use of his hands and feet to take down an opponent. About this time, he was promoted to acting sergeant, even though his rank was only private first class. This rankled some in his unit. Staff Sergeant Wren seemed to take personal insult that a private was doing the same job as he was. Staff Sergeant Wren took every opportunity to make a complaint against Fountain or members of his squad. He even took to assaulting Fountain when there was no witnesses about. Fountain also refused to sign off on bogus charges that Staff Sergeant Wren made against members of Fountain's squad. This publicly embarrassed and insulted Staff Sergeant Wren. A mere private was beloved over him by the company commander. Wren took it upon himself to conduct a vendetta against Fountain and any member of his squad in a bid to save face. When the charges were dismissed, Staff Sergeant Wren was reprimanded by the command. This set in motion an almost inevitable set of actions that could only end in tragedy. During a deployment for three months, the argument became physical. Staff Sergeant Wren slapped Fountain for talking back to him. Fountain spit a mouthful of blood in Wren's face. This caused him to use an M14 to butt stroke Fountain, breaking three of his ribs. The incident was judged to be accidental and no charges were filed against either man. After this deployment, Fountain's unit was put on board a Navy ship as a combat ready force for deployment throughout Asia. When he was docked in the Philippines, he reconnected with his girlfriend, a hooker, at a local bar. She was four months pregnant. She said the child was his and he believed himself to be the father. He gave her a wedding ring, but they were never formally married. Neither the U.S. military nor the Philippine government recognized this marriage. When the ship and the battalion went back to sea, Staff Sergeant Wren continued to physically assault Fountain. He felt that the channel of redress was closed to him. He had a fear of Staff Sergeant Wren as well as a deep hatred and loathing of the man. His unit was deployed to assist in the evacuation of persecuted people from the Khmer Rouge in the Gulf of Siam. He was exposed to extreme violence and he said he was surprised at how little it affected him. Back aboard his ship on 1 May 1974, Fountain prepared for an all night for an inspection that next day. After cleaning and displaying his gear, his platoon lieutenant ordered his men, including Fountain, on a 10 mile run. Upon completion of this run, the platoon was ordered to the mess hall in their physical training t-shirts and short pants. Normally this was not allowed, but the inspection was not finished and the company first sergeant didn't want the troops in the inspection area till it was finished. Staff Sergeant Wren saw Fountain in the mess hall and ordered him to put on his uniform. When he returned to the platoon area, the first sergeant told him to report to the mess dressed as he was. When Fountain returned to the mess, he encountered Staff Sergeant Wren who didn't speak to Fountain. On the 6th of May, uh, Staff Sergeant Wren brought formal charges against Fountain for disobeying his orders. The commander said if the first sergeant would verify that he had countermanded Staff Sergeant Wren's orders, the charges would be dropped. Fountain went in search of the first sergeant but encountered Staff Sergeant Wren, who inquired where Fountain was going. When informed that he was looking for the first sergeant to defend himself against Staff Sergeant Wren's charges, uh, Wren became enraged. Wren assaulted him in a very violent manner. Uh, he said he was going to kill Fountain, his bastard son and the bitch he was living with. This assault pushed Fountain over the edge. All the months of pent-up rage, fear, and hatred boiled over into an obsession to kill. Fountain returned to the ship and stole a 45 caliber pistol, several full magazines for it, and went in search of Wren. Clayton attacked the Marine Guard and took the guard's loaded 12-gauge shotgun. He then went to the Grand Island and R&R &R area for service personnel. He knew that Wren would be attending the battalion party there. He located Wren, ran up to him, and shot him in the heart point-blank with the shotgun, killing him instantly. Fountain was trapped on the island with no escape. He took five Marines hostage. For several hours, he exchanged shots with the military police SWAT team. Finally, he was able to get into a building with two of his hostages. The military police charged the building in an attempt to kill Fountain. 
He caught them in the open and pointed a shotgun straight at them. Everybody froze. It was a tense few seconds. A policeman talked Fountain into putting the shotgun and the 45 on the ground. Fountain was arrested and taken into custody. The standoff had lasted until dark. Fountain was charged with a host of crimes. The most serious was murder. On the 19th of July, 1974, Fountain was convicted of murder, a violation of Article 118 of the Uniform Code of Military Justice, and given a life sentence of hard labor. He said goodbye to his girlfriend and his son in the visiting room of the stockade. He never saw either of them again. He was transported to the U.S. Disciplinary Barracks at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. Now this should have been the end of Fountain's story. Too bad it, I can't say that, uh, you know, that he died of old age in Fort Leavenworth, but uh, his is just the start of a tragic story of death. That is Fountain's life. Next week, I'll continue with the next chapter of Fountain's life in prison at USP Marion, where I worked for 23 years. In the meantime, if you have questions or comments, you can make them on my channel page. Don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell to be notified of my future videos. If you want to watch a weekly video, and not the few that you see on YouTube, uh, you can do it for as little as $1 a month. People are driving by here. Um, on Patreon, you can get more videos and behind-the-scenes peeks at my life and documents. Uh, if you pay enough, I'll even answer videos for you personally. So, I'd like to thank you for watching and see you next week with the conclusion of uh, Fountain Story.